Hello, good day, and welcome to the first Creative Technologies meeting and symposium this autumn semester. Today we're going to have a little bit different take on extended realities. I said virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed realities, they are starting to form their nature in our society in different shapes and forms. Today we will have two different kind of speakers talking about certain kind of extended takes on those realities. Our first speaker today will be Dooley Murphy, uh, alumni of Copenhagen University and XR researcher. And he's going to talk about his previous projects and certain kind of visions. And the second uh, talk today will be Jussi Mäkinen from Vario, CBO. And he will talk from a different angle about the certain kind of future possibilities and future ma manifestations of these kind of uh, extended realities. And first of all, thank you, Dooley Murphy. Have a good one. Thank you. Yep. Hello. So for the entirety of the 1990s, um, we were obsessed with cyberspace, uh, or at least the concept of cyberspace. And uh, we used to think that cyberspace would be a place, um, a place synonymous with virtual reality. Um, we had a very specific, and it turns out, very uh, inaccurate idea of what cyberspace would look like, what it would be like, and how it would uh, shape our everyday lives. We imagined 3D grids extending off into infinity. We pictured information superhighways, uh, neon cityscapes, electric shopping malls, stuff like that. Even serious VR researchers uh, spoke breathlessly of bar charts or bar graphs the size of skyscrapers. Um, but instead, we got the internet, first in the form of email and the World Wide Web, and then later apps. Yeah, so massively multiplayer online games or virtual worlds have been around for a long time, but uh, the cyberspace that we were promised isn't quite what we got. Instead, we got MySpace, eBay, and uh, RuneScape. And nobody really needed a bar graph the size of a skyscraper, in my opinion. Um, and I think today, it feels kind of quaint, kind of anachronistic, that that's what we thought that we would get. And that we thought it could arrive as soon as the 1990s. Um, so my opening claim is this. It's pretty difficult to predict the future, at least accurately. Um, we're generally not very good at thinking ahead of the curve. When we see something beginning to sprout, we can predict its trajectory. But imagining something that doesn't yet exist at all is really hard. So uh, fortunately, I have a solution. In respect to certain XR technologies and applications, I think there are designerly ways to avoid having to place bets on whether or when or how a technology might emerge or uh, when technologies might converge, disappear completely, succeed, fail, and so on. So a possible first step is looking to the past, learning from the past. And uh, the XR landscape, needless to say, is changing so rapidly um, it can sometimes even be counterproductive to get caught up in all the different possibilities of how things could unfold. Um, all we know really for sure is that XR, or the collection of technologies we call XR, is very much in its infancy still. And in that regard, uh, I think we can broadly compare it to cinema. Now, normally I get a few gasps from the audience when I say that, but... Um, what I mean is not that creating for XR or creating with XR is in any way like creating film, filmmaking. Um, but rather, I think we can profitably analogize the emergence of cinema as a medium, as an art form, to the very beginnings of XR as a medium, as an expressive tool. Um, we can learn something, I think, from looking at early film art, specifically how film, cinema, filmmakers' repertoire of uh, tools, the language or grammar of film evolved in leaps and bounds. It grew almost exponentially in the first three or four decades following the, uh, the medium's inception. So roughly the turn of the century to the 30s or 40s. Um, and that's when uh, the formal rules of cinematic storytelling, as it were, 
uh, started or ended up crystallizing, I think. So, for instance, I think it was at least 25 years uh, after film's first flight that the Russian film theorist Lev Kuleshov um, put into writing, into words, that you can show a shot of an object, cut to an actor's facial expression, and audiences would automatically, reliably infer that the reaction, the expression, was a response to the object shown. Um, we now know this is well, lots of different things, but I call it a shot reaction shot, and it's the staple of almost every movie ever. It's the first thing you learn about in film school. And uh, it might have taken a lot longer for us to discover this, for filmmakers to discover this, were it not for the fact that the first half of the 20th century was a time of uh, vigorous experimentation and debate. So in case you hadn't guessed, I'm going to limit the purview of my talk here to XR as a creative medium, as an expressive medium. Um, I'm going to talk almost exclusively about VR, art and entertainment. Um, XR is obviously going to be used for so many different things that I've already suggested are difficult, if not impossible, to predict. Um, like the internet, it will become so intricately woven, enmeshed in the fabric of our lives um, that we'll probably have to learn to tune certain aspects of XR out, lest we suffer from information overload. Um, of course, it may be the case that everything you can care to say about VR also applies equally to other forms of XR, but this seems unlikely. And it could be the case that everything you care to say about art and entertainment applies equally to task-oriented software or productivity apps. This seems somehow even less likely. Um, With that in mind, one reason I think it's sensible to confine this kind of an argument to just art and entertainment is that we can be certain. I guarantee one of the few things, or oh, one of the few things, sorry, one of the things that XR will be used for is storytelling. Um, many forms of art and entertainment are, in some sense, narrative, and uh, this is possibly both a symptom and a cause of the fact that we will always want stories. We think narratively. I'll come to that in a minute. Humans are innately storytelling creatures. Um, it's how we pass down knowledge through the generations. It's how we practice taking other people's perspectives. And besides music, I would say that narrative is one of the throughgoing human behaviors or traditions. Um, narrative is a cognitive and cultural universal. And uh, across all continents and human epochs, we see storytelling take root and flourish. Uh, the question, I think, is how will XR change the shape of storytelling? Because we've already seen video games begin to exert their influence on how nav narratives are constructed and transmitted. Um, but I think the video game medium's impact on narrative still hasn't fully coalesced. Um, it's a relatively young medium. What some of the earliest video games did for us um, and I'm being reductive here for the sake of brevity, uh, is to first and foremost change the default focalization of narratives. So focalization is, of course, just a fancy way of saying the perspective that a story is told from. Um, Third-person narratives are about other people, generally. Um, First-person narratives put you behind the eyes of either an omniscient or a diegetic in-world narrator. And then second-person narratives, the rarest of them all, of course, um, continually address you. They're about you. They bring you into the story. And it can be almost exhausting sometimes, at least for me, in print, being told what I am doing when I'm not doing the thing. Um, I think is a little less taxing in graphical games. You are in the garden by the house because in games you have agency, obviously, so you often do choose to do the thing that you're being told you're doing. It's just a little more comfortable, a little less uh, surprising. You pick up the, amp, uh, the, the lamp, you fire an arrow at the ogre. It makes sense because those are the things that you have done. So some early VR theorists um, insisted that the emerging medium, like video games, like the primitive video games that they were considering, would be defined by uh, agency and the second-person perspective that some types of literature, postmodern literature, were trying to emulate. Um, these theorists 
saw agency in the kind of hypertext literature or multi-user dungeons that were popular in their day. And what drew their attention especially was effective action, effective acting, um, feeling in control, feeling powerful, being given, quote, meaningful choices, and being able to see the outcomes or consequences of your choices and actions. So for these people, um, by the way, we have here the venerable Janet Murray and also Brenda Laurel. Um, for these people, agency was mostly about volitional behaviors, doing things on purpose and getting exactly what you expected. Um, and coming as they do from the worlds of theater and literature, it's very easy to map the idea of um, empowered audience participation onto the emerging VR medium. So it's all about doing, and moreover, successful doing. Uh, the user, the participant, the immersant being listened to, uh, having your inputs respected, as it were. So the analog or the metaphor that um, theorists like Laurel and Murray uh, perhaps prematurely attributed to VR storytelling, the future of narrative in cyberspace, uh, is this, the holodeck from Star Trek. And uh, just in case you haven't been exposed, the holodeck in the Star Trek universe is a virtual reality generating room or space. It lets you create your own perfectly realistic and plausible and very similar stories on the fly. Uh, you give it a prompt, like a detective thriller set during the Prohibition, or um, English period drama in which a number of dashing suitors compete for my hand in marriage. And the holodeck would process that input, and it would uh, spin an original, original narrative yarn right then and there on the spot. You start playing, you start living this story, and you can guide the holodeck, guide the computer um, to, to suit your every whim and fancy. Um, computer, give Mr. Darcy more chest hair, or whatever floats your boat. And the holodeck certainly gives you agency, but agency alone, I would say, does not an interactive experience make. Um, having agency in an interactive story, uh, or a story that claims to be interactive, is certainly better than not having agency and being kind of relegated to the role of an invisible observer. Um, but if all I can do is act, act, act some more, and it's all very effective, and I get exactly what I want all the time, then I might start to wonder if I really belong in that world. Uh, it's acknowledging my presence, but it doesn't feel quite right. I'm too powerful. You might start to feel overpowered, or OP, as, as gamers say, um, meaning you are too powerful, not that you're being overpowered. Um, you might start to feel like some kind of fantastical being that's accidentally crash-landed in this virtual world populated by uh, servile, simple simulacra who follow your every whim and fancy. And I don't want my game master or dungeon master if you're a Dungeons & Dragons fan, to be that pliable. I don't want a system to be overly suggestible, right? I need some pushback from my cyber bard. And I believe that thoughtfully designed VR or XR experiences uh, should not only give me agency, but actually, conversely, that they should confine me in some ways, put me in compromising situations, um, captivate me against my will, uh, make me hold my breath, invade my personal space, and uh, deliver visceral shocks and startles and thrills. So, if we, if you, accept this um, manifesto-esque claim as broadly plausible and desirable, um, then how best to work towards such aesthetic ends? I think one way to start is to designate, to label the opposite of agency. Um, and I think that that thing, whatever, whatever term we choose to designate it, the opposite of agency is not inaction. It's not failing to do something. Um, it's not a lack of choice, it's not passivity or even restriction. Rather, I think agency's opposite number is the unwieldy word that you saw on the first slide, albeit very quickly, I skipped through it, patiency. Patiency is a term that I'm borrowing from linguistics and from moral philosophy. And uh, it basically refers to the condition and the experience of being or feeling acted upon oneself. Um, and it, that can be positive 
acting upon, that can be negative acting upon, or kind of neutral, ambiv ambivalent patiency. So if someone slaps you in the face, then according to a linguist and a moral philosopher, they are the agent, you receiving the slap are the patient. Um, the same holds true, actually, if someone pats you on the back and says, there, there, everything's going to be okay. They are the agent, you receiving that gesture are the patient. And uh, other positive examples, if someone smiles at you flirtatiously and that excites you, gives you butterflies in your stomach, and this can happen in VR or real life, the person smiling and winking is the agent, you are the patient, they're acting on you. Um, I think you get the idea, but some rapid-fire examples. A doctor administering a, administering a vaccine is an agent. The recipient of the vaccine is a patient. Um, in the movie E.T., when the main character, Elliot, is riding his bike through the forest, he is an agent. E.T., in the front basket, being shaken around violently, is a patient. But then when E.T. makes the bike fly, he becomes the agent. And Elliot, no longer really in control of the flying bicycle, becomes the patient. There are ambiguous examples. A person in the middle of a human pyramid, agent or patient, kind of both. Or maybe you know, only one at a time, but in rapid succession. Um, or a person bungee jumping. If they, uh, if they did it volitionally, they're an agent, but they're subject to the force of gravity, kind of a patient. So you get the picture, really. Um, patiency, I would hold can be positive, but uh, to bring it back to VR, I like to locate patiency in the kind of deliberately designed um, moments, experiences that give us kind of bumps and shocks and really remind us that we are embodied individuals with kind of corporeal vulnerabilities. So again, while I insist that many forms of patiency, both in VR and in real life, are pleasant, it's the uncomfortable or the kind of mixed affective uh, manifestations of patiency that make VR, XR compelling to me as a creator and as a consumer. Um, here are some actual examples of interesting patiency experiences in VR. The top left image is from an app called VR Vaccine. Um, it's a 360 movie, actually, it's not interactive, shown to children receiving shots, and uh, this character, a princess, touches a fire fruit to the child's arm at exactly the same moment the doctor sticks them with the needle. So the kid has a kind of um, mildly uh, uncomfortable tactile experience as they are being acted on by the character and the doctor in real life. Um, but they're also reassured that they're being protected. So that's nice. Um, You've got the London heist for PlayStation VR. For me, being tied, virtually tied to a chair and interrogated by this thug was way more compelling than any of the, uh, the game's car chases or shootouts. Um, way more memorable. This one with the planet in it is Bonfire by Baobab Studios. Um, there are more than 50 levers on screen at the beginning, and any one that you care to pull turns out to be the wrong lever. It makes your ship, your spaceship, crash land into the planet. So I think there's a kind of twofold patiency going on here. Uh, you think you're being an agent controlling the spaceship. Oh no, you've been duped. It was a false choice. It was an illusion of choice. And uh, the sensation of hurtling towards the planet's surface as well is a kind of patiency experience analogous to a roller coaster, which I think most people have tried in VR by this point. What else? Um, Richie's plank experience is familiar to most people, as long as that gives you the kind of intended uh, vertigo sensation, vertiginous reaction, I would say you're having a patiency experience. Wolves in the walls here, a magic potion blows up in your face, uh, the titular wolves lunge at you and kind of give you this reflex uh, startle. And uh, experiences of sublimity, perhaps religious, sublime experiences, a kind of like patiency experiences, insofar as you may feel insignificant, powerless, vulnerable. So you should have a sense by now that uh, patiency can scarcely exist in isolation from agency. Um, the satisfying feeling of taking action and the unnerving experience of being acted upon or of being um, 
potentially acted upon by something or someone have to be balanced and interwoven by experienced designers. And uh, one theorist who acknowledged this, a theorist practitioner, um, was promoting patiency, not in name, uh, but in principle, while others were advocating mainly for agency, is this person, um, Josephine Anstey. And uh, Anstey, like Laurel, created as well as just writing about VR, but her work strikes me as grittier, kind of more absurd, less idealistic. Um, and she repeatedly kind of articulates a design uh, ethos of almost bullying, I'm going to say. Bullying your VR user, your VR participant. Um, engineering situations where um, the user, the participant, is kind of led down a narrow path. She talks about snares, as in traps, setting up traps or pitfalls for the user. And uh, if any of this sounds kind of mad, kind of... Uh, sociopathic, then I think it's worth remembering that there are plenty of other forms of entertainment that depend on uh, leading or misleading the user, manipulating expectations and responses. Um, plenty of stand-up comedians set up a joke and then deliver a punchline that deliberately defies your expectations. Magicians or illusionists, um, even sleight-of-hand artists, sometimes referred to as professional pickpockets, uh, use diversionary tactics to kind of lull you into a false sense of security and then, oh my god, he's taken my watch or uh, you know, pulled a string of handkerchiefs out of my ear or whatever. And these are kind of analogous to patiency experiences as well, I would say. These kinds of moments, I would say, are often enrapturing and we can learn from them and begin to work them into our VR or XR experiences insofar as they underscore that agency has its opposite and must be counterbalanced all the time. So despite the examples I've cited, ah! um, despite the examples I've cited all feeling rather unsubtle or on the nose, uh, I don't think patiency is a gimmick or a novelty uh, that will kind of fade into obscurity and cease to feature in VR or XR as the medium slowly but surely matures. Um, in the 1980s, film historians um, identified and articulated uh, the first wave of cinema or certain productions in the first wave of cinema as uh, a cinema of attractions. In so doing, they implied, whether they intended to or not, that um, there's something kind of shallow or unsophisticated about um, wanting to wow audiences. Um, I hope to have made a case that uh, patience is an important and perhaps innate feature of VR or XR experiences like other forms of entertainment. And um, I'd say that we can profit by using a label, even a cumbersome one like patience, to talk about how to counterbalance user input or agency. So just as non-interactive narratives like novels or stage plays uh, function by giving us a mixed bag of positive and negative emotions. Interactive narratives must give us agency and patience in rapid alternating succession, not necessarily in equal measure, but uh, in juxtaposition, you know, by using one to cast the other into sharp relief. I'll try to end by looping back on my opening claim um, predicting the future is difficult. The 1990s vision of cyberspace turned out not to be virtual reality, uh, but rather the web. And now VR or XR is having a resurgence. And uh, in some respects, we've learned little. We're still obsessed with the idea of having a persistent and uh, globally networked, uh, it perfectly interoperable um, set of virtual worlds. Only this time we're calling it or that collection of worlds the metaverse. If you attend VR conferences or any kind of event, you will inevitably eventually hear someone say something like, uh, XR contact lenses are only five years away, and that has been the case forever. And eventually, sooner or later, of course, the person making that prediction will be right. But I think if we look back in time and all the people that have said stuff like that, then more often than not, we're wrong when we make even well-informed, educated guesses. So, you know brain-computer interfaces going mainstream. We know they're possible, but when will they be in our heads? Um, 5, 10, 15 years? I don't know. Robust, full-body, markerless tracking. 
three to five years, is that fair to say? I personally don't like to make these kinds of predictions, but I am always content to listen to um, more well-informed people's uh, best guesses. And uh, yeah, I prefer to focus on the part of the equation, the part of the system that has remained stable and constant for well over a few thousand years, the embodied human user. So if you design XR experiences, um, I would say probably don't try and spend too much time on uh, worrying about or anticipating the limitations of your hardware or your software. Um, if only my HMD were tetherless, if only my hand tracking were a little snappier, if only I could squeeze a few thousand more polygons or a few more physics operations out of my CPU or GPU, then my thing would be a killer app. Um, it's a fallacy, don't fall for it. Uh, look instead for cognitive constants, um, emotional universals, uh, the psychological principles that underpin the totality of our experience, our being in the world. We are all unique, yes, we're all different, but Every person is capable of experiencing joy, anger, fear, sadness to an extent. Uh, we're all capable of laughter. Uh, we still have, uh, we all have some empathic ability, some minimal empathic ability, and we all have reflexes. We have an instinct for self-preservation. You can play to that, you can take advantage of it. Um, we all have a pre-theoretical understanding of object permanence. You can toy with that as well. Um, and we all crave narratives. We, creators, um, ought to start thinking seriously about what it means to bring the body or the embodied mind into the story world and for the participant to suddenly have more than just a primitive ability to passively witness a story unfold. Now they're living it. Thank you. Thank you, Dooley. There was a good start and good introduction from design to the next topic at hand, the back end. Jussi Mäkinen, uh, the chief uh, brand officer of Varjo, has a long history in, uh, in the industry in an extended way. He has been working uh, with Nokia and many, many other companies. He's also an investor in the future and upcoming companies and Jussi is gonna now reveal something about more of the structures that provide us the tools for experience design and tools for the experience itself. Welcome Jussi. Great. Thanks everyone. Um, cool, my name is Jussi Mäkinen and I work for the company called Varjo. Uh, does anyone have heard of Varjo? Raise your hands. Quite many have heard of Vario. Vario is about seven years old startup um, from, uh, from Helsinki. Um, I was part of the founding team back in the day, and uh, we are doing the world's best VR and XR for professionals. So I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we have learned along the way, and, and maybe it's something that inspires you. A uh, little bit of my background. My background is purely in marketing. I'm, I have not received a technical training. Uh, it's a marketing storytelling. I used to work at Nokia in the open source product development, then at Rovio creating the uh, Angry Birds brand and the movie and all that kind of stuff. And then kind of like ventured back to technology uh, with Vario. I've uh, been living in Asia uh, quite a lot in, in Tokyo and China and, and Seoul. But that's my background. And the way that we kind of constructed the narrative for Vario is very simple. Um, the technology is, is, is very complex, um, but the way that we talk about the technology, which is very complex, is very simple. We talk basically of a human eye resolution, VR and XR for professionals. And, and there's a reason why we do this, because simplicity in many times drives the adoption. The more deep the technology, more complex it is, the more simple the story is that you have to tell for it. Uh, but a little bit background of Vario, so we are around 200 people now, um, mostly working in Helsinki HQ. We do hardware, software, services, and uh, a few of the customers that we are 
serving at the moment is jet fighter pilots, pilot training. That's a big part of our business, so people can actually train uh, to fly big planes without actually taking them to the sky. So, this, so the savings are quite huge. Um, another one good example is astronauts. So with uh, NASA and, and European Space Agency, both are using our mixed reality technology, train in zero gravity, train docking the, um, um, the, the satellites and all those kind of things. So it's, it's quite, a, quite an exciting, exciting thing. And a really big segment of our customers is car designers. So car designers and engineers, uh, BMW, Audi, Kia, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Volvo. Uh, Volvo has invested in, in Vario a little bit as well. And uh, that has kind of helped us to also to develop the products in a, in a very unique way because no one gives as uh, prudent feedback as a German uh, engineer or a designer. So the requirements towards Vario are very high. It's fun to work with these guys. And then finally, medical training is a big part of what we do. In here, for example, uh, these medics are, are uh, working with the mannequin, but everything that they see around them, the, gre the, the blue background is transformed in the real time into uh, in the field where the, what they are seeing. So it's, uh, they can do a mixed reality training, which gives them the feeling and impact that, like they would be actually in the field. Super interesting. Uh, but like I said, um, for my work and what we have done at Vario from the very beginning, it has been to me as a, as a kind of marketeer and brand person quite simple. Is that we are working with very complex technologies, very complex things. Uh, when I joined, people were talking about pixels and prototypes and all this kind of like super deep tech. And I said, like, we, what we need to really do is that we need to simplify the complex. That's the first thing, that all this thing is super complex, we need to simplify it. And once that is simplified, then the second step is actually make it desirable. Yeah. Make it sexy in a common language. And, uh, and that's not an easy part, but that's where you really need uh, kind of marketing and branding that people actually pay attention. Because nowadays, people, you know, there's so much new companies, so much new technology, people don't really pay attention to that unless you are able to create a desire towards it. And, 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 and that's what we kind of like set ourselves to do from the very beginning. And then uh, the, the really crucial part is making the marketing and the R&D and the design work together very closely. Many companies, many startups, they, don't, they have tech people creating the tech. They don't understand why they need marketing, why they need storytelling. And, uh, and this is what I've been saying, that it is the work of the R&D and marketing to wor work very closely from the beginning to create the story, to impute the, st impute the story. And I give you an example. So um, in 2018, uh, we were in a workshop uh, with Wario from the very beginning, and we created a roadmap for like, you know, uh, up to 2050. Like what is happening? W when does the neural link happen? What kind of things Apple will bring? We kind of predicted it quite right. And you know, where the brain link UI happens somewhere in 2050. 2030, we have a programmable world, all this thing. And, um, and, and one of my colleagues, Antti, brought up with this uh, kind of image, which is great. It's, it's incredible, like, you know, this is, this is the world we'll go. And what, but what I was kind of saying, that this is exactly the kind of complexity that we need to simplify in order to create a story and create the products that we are wanting to create for the future. So what we kind of like um, together kind of like came out of this complexity of technology is that what Vario really wants to do is this one. Um, and and I, I, I showed a picture of a church, like back in the day, before computers, TVs, radios, people went to church to create and to experience this kind of absolute immersion, like a transcendence to a different place. And, and, and you know, behi behind all this technology, what we really were after was this idea of absolute immersion, how we could create it. And, um, and, and, and this is we kind of like set our path towards. And of course, we translate it into our, our brand and how we kind of like wanted to create that kind of feeling and sensation through the Varios brand. And, uh, and, and we kind of like set out ourselves to do these kind of different technologies for absolute immersion. And, and next I'm going to go through a few of these technologies that we believe that are the basis uh, for the future up to 2030, up to 2050, what will kind of really change the world. Um, so, so these are the kind of notes uh, what we'll be creating the future. The first I want to discuss is eye tracking. 
Um, from the very beginning of Vario, we knew that in order to process that raw computing power coming from the computer to your eyes, create a technology where you see the real world through our headset without any kind of noticeable lag, we need to be uh, doing something called eye tracking. So that we can know, we know where you are looking at, so that we can put the raw computing power to that point that where you are looking at, that that processes those pixels. In technical terms, it's called foveated rendering. And, um, and um, uh, we were looking at a few companies, kind of like um, um, subcontract their, their algorithms, but they all got bought out by, by bigger tech companies. So we set up that we actually have to do this technology ourselves. And, and it became very apparent that this technology is very in the heart of the future of VR and XR, eye tracking. Who has the best eye tracking? Who can do it? Who controls the technology? And why is it so? The reason is that we actually can predict where your eyes are looking at next. It's not anymore that we just can follow, but we can predict where it goes next. And think about this. In the future, if you have your AR glass or VR glasses, and you're looking at the real world, or you're looking at any kind of like virtual content or internet content, we can actually know which letter you are looking at, which, which word are you looking at. So this eye tracking becomes, you know, think about this as like kind of like super hypercharged version of like tracking what you're doing on the internet with your mouse. So because now you can actually like not only see and predict where you're looking, but your eyes give so much more imp uh, kind of information. So it, it gives this kind of like even a notion of how excited you are, how aroused you are, how much intention, what's your kind of like emotional state. And actually, like, which is, you know, pretty scary, but you can even, like, by following your eyes, you can know, like, a sexual orient orientation of a person, right? So, if you give this kind of, like, power to somebody else, let's say a bigger tech company, to have those power of kind of reading your mind, it becomes quite, a, quite powerful. So, I do believe that this is the future of UI. Uh, eye tracking um, and advertising as well, because you know exactly what you're looking at. And this needs to be heavily regulated, right? And I've been talking uh, this with, um, uh, with EU uh, Tech Council as well in a few, few of my talks in VR days of Europe, that this is like, you know, forget the tracking of your mouse in a computer. This is the thing that you really need to be regulating. Uh, so super important, uh, super powerful. And, and for example, when we are giving demos of Vario headset, we always say that, you know, now your eyes are tracked. So we know exactly where you're looking at. So a um, few of the companies or, or our customers are using this, for example, to predict uh, Alzheimer disease. So there's the Swiss company who is doing this with Vario headset. So the movement of your eyes can give an indication, will you have a kind of like a Alzheimer in the future? It's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Um, so we do believe that in uh, 25 uh, plus 2025, this will be used all the time. All the headsets, all the things that you will put in your heads will have eye tracking. And, and there are companies who are using eye tracking, for example, with regular uh, eyeglasses uh, already starting to become technology on that one. So the eye tracking doesn't need a big, big headset. Uh, it can be put in a very small place. So um, when you combine this, for example, with the AI, it will start to know your actions before you do. So uh, eye tracking, uh, super powerful, very interesting. Already we at Vario can use this for interaction and, and following your eyes. Super important, keep this in mind, uh, eye tracking. The second one is um, also tracking. This is about hand tracking. Uh, so this is about natural interaction in all realities. In reality, we will you know, grab things and now we are you know, grabbing these in virtual and mixed reality as well. Um, so, uh, this is something that's already being done, of course, now you're grabbing air, and there are these kind of clunky, um, clunky gloves being developed already, I don't think they are yet any, any, any good, uh, but the first nor neural, neural connections are, are, are actually coming soon. And again, in 25, this will be used all the time, so, you know, forget the controllers, it's your hand, you're creating these motions, it, it will it will be used all the time. Uh, current challenge is still the accuracy, so they are not as accurate as an co external controller, but they will be. They will be. Um, pressure sensitivity, haptics, uh, these are already happening. Again, they're a bit clunky, 
they will get much better in, in, in the few, few next few years. But it's our prediction in 2030, we do feel the virtual world already without uh, being too much in discomfort. Um, so these technologies are, are definitely coming, but that's what is lacking at the moment, feeling the virtual world. That will, that will definitely happen. Already, when we are doing these experiments with virtual world, you can have this kind of phantom sensation already. If you, if you see things that are kind of like um, uh, realistic enough, um, but that will only get better in the future. So hand tracking, second. The third thing is about workflows. So uh, we do believe that this kind of 2D and 3D are becoming one continuum of a workplace, of a workflow. And in this video that runs uh, badly at the moment, but you can see that we are in Varjo uh, HQ, uh, one of our colleagues has a headset on, and he can start to drop down virtual furniture on top of our empty space. So he kind of like runs the Unity editor at the same time. This is, by the way, a stock Unity edi editor, just kind of like, um, downloaded from the from the Unity store, so nothing is custom made for Vario, and you can do those things in real time with Unity Editor, drop things onto the real world, and and kind of start to plan it. So the 2D and 3D are becoming one big continuum. Uh, in the 3D engines are driving it, and 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 the other software are following it. Uh, in 25, for sure, uh, monitors, real monitors, start to decline. Um, they're you know, the visual quality of the headsets and many other headsets apart from Vario that are coming are driving this, driving this change. So the use of virtual monitors will start to go up, physical things will start to go down. Um, in 25, copying everything to mixed reality will become instant. So you look at a thing with a headset or with a camera, you scan it, you upload it, it's already there. Uh, the di digital twin is, is created in an instant. And um, also, products will become virtual before they come physical. So all the products will have a virtual twin or, or a digital twin, and you can experience that on top of the real world before you have the physical things. And slowly, things will become only virtual, not, not physical anymore. And like I said in our roadmap, we believe in 2030, a programmable world will happen, which means that all the things like a kitchen appliance, everything will have an interface um, that is virtual. So it doesn't need to have a button, physical buttons anymore. You actually control it with your f phone or with your headset. Um, so a programmable world will actually start to emerge on top of our world. And then um, remote, remote work. So this is of course the thing that uh, during the pandemic, this was a big thing. Um, a lot of our customers, for example, German car makers, were starting to experiment with this one. For example, Kia. Uh, this uh, video is from the Kia's, Kia's factory in, 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 in Germany. Um, they used to travel to Korea, so that they were four days. They traveled to Korea, did a workshop there, came back to Germany, and, um, and, and, and that took a lot of time, a lot of, lot of money. But nowadays, they actually converted to doing that. During the pandemic, they started to do it in virtual with our headset and with the software called Autodesk V-RED. And they did it basically in four hours. So the saving was quite, uh, quite substantial. So what happened during the pandemic is kind of like the best parts of that virtual work or remote work are, are staying. A lot of companies are, of course, saying that you need to be back in the office and, and the physical work is still important, being physically present. But for many companies, these kind of like companies that can now do these things faster and cheaper virtually are sticking into it. And, and car companies are, are a great example of that one. So it's already effective with car manufacturers, for example. And again, in a few more years, uh, taking the place, we do believe it's, it's basically everyone who can, who can start to work in that way. Of course, not all companies will adapt it, but it becomes possible. Um, one thing that Vario is working on this is this kind of notion of teleportation. So teleportation basically means that you can scan your environment in, uh, immediately with, with a headset or with a phone. You can upload it to the cloud and you can invite other people to that pl same place that you are in. So uh, teleportation is one of these kind of like um, R&D projects that we have going on. Uh, we have created some examples of that one and are kind of like creating a service out from teleportation. Um, so yeah, like I said, you can scan, instant transfer of location and people, that will happen, ha happen as well. 
And, uh, you know, in a few years, there will be more and more professions that are purely in VR or XR. Um, so everything that you do will be basically in this, in this virtual world or metaverse. Um, that will happen. Um, I, and we believe at Varia that this will happen in the industrial or enterprise metaverse first, um, because there's, the, again, the savings are there, quite substantial. And, um, and um, uh, we, are, we are working very closely with these companies and many others and, and creating, creating these things. But basically, like I said, uh, remote work, eye tracking, hand tracking, workflows, these are the things, these are the kind of building blocks that we see uh, happening now in the next five to, five to ten years. And, um, and that's basically it. Those were the lessons from the, from the Vario, Vario's future, what we've been building and doing. And uh, uh, if you have very interest, reach out to me, come by to see what we're doing at Vario. We are, we are basically in, in Kaisaniemi, next to Kaisaniemi. Uh, metro station, so we are very happy to, to host uh, students to see what kind of work we are doing and, and uh, please come by and, and, and try our technology. It's already, already happening and already kind of like a reality today. Big thank you. And I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. I'm Petri Juntunen from Aalto University, a doctoral researcher. And thank you, guests, for your talks here. Yeah, super interesting. And now we'll have like a, this kind of follow-up discussion. And we'll have like a five to ten minutes for audience questions as well. So you can start to prepare and prime yourself if you have any. But to, go, to, give, <laughs> to begin with... Uh, there's some interesting, this kind of um, potential, but also risks in virtual reality. And for example, uh, who's going to maybe dominate or handle the biggest parts of metaverse? And you see your other company or uh, investment meeting VR, you talk about little piece of the metaverse. These little pieces, for example, for normal normal user, end user, what could these little pieces be, and how could they like relate in this larger landscape of virtual meta worlds and digital twins? Yeah, I, I think those are happening already now. Meet in VR is a is, is a meeting application, like a virtual meeting application, where you can feel presence of other people. Um, through their avatars and through a virtual settings that you are in. And, and that's helped many companies, uh, especially during the pandemic, kind of to feel closer. So that's kind of like small part of it. Then there's uh, many other kind of VR chat, for example, in the consumer space where people can, you know, be whatever they want, what kind of avatar ever they want to be and, you know, have a, have a techno raves and all that. So you can see, you, we're seeing those kind of little pieces pieces here and there um, kind of happening. But I don't think a big breakthrough has yet happened, uh, for sure. Um, but I, I think it's a combination of, of, of easy to use, you know, easy access, having these headsets or these technologies more widely available and cheaper and all that. So it will definitely, I mean, like, I'm kind of like thinking myself, like, w when somebody comes up with the WhatsApp of, of mixed reality, you know, maybe it's Apple, maybe it's, you know, some new startup that hasn't even emerged yet. But, you know, that level of simplicity and easiness that you just kind of like click and you're there. And, and ultimately, I do believe, like, it, it is, has to do with this kind of teleportation that you can just scan this room immediately and, and kind of not only rely on synthetic pre-made rooms that, you know, under a magical waterfall or something. But I, will, I do believe that these pieces of the, co of the metaverse will actually start to emerge faster so that we can actually bring pieces of this reality uh, into a digital realm rather than like people crafting out like imaginary worlds. So I, I do believe in that kind of like, you know, bridging the gap between real and the, and the metaverse through scanning and transferring real places into, in the, into the cloud. Um, so, yeah. 
that will happen uh, bit by bit. Yeah. During the pandemic, uh, that uh, period of time, I also like personally used virtual reality and I noticed that the certain kind of space between the sofa and TV was my personal space within virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And I tried to start to build certain kind of uh, external rooms inside rooms mm. that just virtual spaces that I could inhabit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of potential do you see like a people or like a small communities creating the personal sites and where should those be located in that sense? Like uh, should these kind of uh, beginnings be communi community driven or platform driven or who's going to take care of those uh, virtual places? Good, good question. I, I think in the, um, the enterprise world or the commercial world is somewhat like more straightforward because there you have you have a need for, similarly, similarly as you have a need for a meeting room in the real world, you have a need for a space to people like, you know, come together and, and solve problems and, and discuss things. So you do have some kind of like pre-made idea of like who maintains and who drives and, and how those things happen. So I think that's more predictable than, than in a consumer space. Things will happen much more unpredictably. Um, so there's much more much more creativity that's what will happen at chaos, uh, which is a great thing. Um, but, uh, but maybe it's, um, it's more straightforward in the, in the enterprise or in the, in, the, in the commercial world. Yeah. And Dooley, for you, like, because like, we often talk about virtual reality in a binary way. It's either simulations or this kind of a simulacra that many enterprises and companies are dealing with. They are like a very straightforward systems with a very, t very limited narrative. Mm. And on the other hand, what's talked about is this gamification, where that we have narrative-driven games that we uh, consume, like we consume books or films. But do you think that that's the limit? Are there certain kind of extensions for different modes of being and non-narrated narratives and this kind of uh, combination of personal and public spaces? What do you take upon? Yeah, there's absolutely space for it, and I think that we're already seeing them. Um, unfortunately, these more interesting, hard-to-classify experiences often get relegated to the section of um, digital storefronts, like I'm thinking the Oculus Store, mm. uh, an umbrella uh, category just called narrative or something. And it might be, it might not be. It could be you know, a diorama, which isn't necessarily narrative. It could be a, a tableau in VR, um, or just a space. Um, and maybe it's a function of the fact that we narrativize our own experience as we're having it, that, that people call them narrative. But I think it's more likely just that um, it's economic logic making, making the big uh, platforms divide things into yeah, stories. Um, these things are educational. Mm -hmm. These things are games, per se. Of course, games are notoriously hard to define. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the experimentation is already happening, and it's just a case of... Um, consumers, but more importantly, um, distributors uh, playing, playing catch-up and coming up with more accurate uh, classifications for these types of, I was almost going to say content. I hate the word content. It, it <laughs> homogenizes everything. Um, these, these types of experiences in potentia that you can have, that you can live. Yeah. Do you have, uh, as a re uh, researcher or research background, do have you come across the, like this kind of, uh, what kind of extensions could we have? Have you been like uh, imagining even a little bit into the future, or a little bit more into the future, that these different modes that we could have, like uh, not only games, but, but, but. Um, it's something I would be yeah hesitant to. Uh to foist upon people. Um, I think the reason that people use the term experiences is that it's incredibly broad and generic. Um, we're having to work with the categories of the past, unsurprisingly, so you can have VR documentaries, you can have VR biopics, um, you can have VR field trips. I think that one's a little more interesting because it, uh, it emphasizes the kind of um, sense of transportation the sense of spatial presence that you get in a captured or simulated environment. Um, but quite how it will shake up the way we think of, I don't know, historic sites, which I think is what your question was kind of getting at. How do we think of the, the, the things, the objects of depiction or representation that we experience in XR? Um, 
I'm not sure. It could be that we evolve um, new media schemata. Uh, to briefly try and explain what I mean by that, we, we have um, different sort of contemporary faculties uh, for you know engaging with things like news and other kinds of representation when we watch based on a true story or inspired by a true story flicks we we know that it is mostly representative reality but not and maybe we'll develop new kinds of sensibilities and critical tools for making sense of VR that way mm. yeah Regarding then the worlds and the interactions with those worlds, uh, you see, you have been it, for ventures um, dealing and contemplating uh, the future of artificial intelligence in the in this, for example, in this world, but also in the virtual worlds. Like uh, the immediate thing that uh, comes to one's mind when thinking about AI, for example, in virtual worlds, there could be for example, generative narrators, they could create content on the fly. They could be extension to your, for example, cues and interactions with virtual reality, with voice communication. But what other extensions could there be, for example, and what you've been thinking of and about? Yeah, I, I think the um, the ultimate kind of thing, like, like the linear presentation, the holodeck, and I don't think it's that far away really to have, like nowadays already, like Gen AI creates you, uh, you know, 2D and 3D images out from your prompt. So it's not like too far that just think that you are, you put a headset on and you start to think, you start to describe the reality that you want to be. And, you know, that reality starts to form around you. But I, th I think the right way to think about it, that it, it will not be like accurate representation of the real world. It's like these more surreal hallucinations, as you can see in the, be in the beginning of days in the, in the generative AI. It will start like that. Uh, then it will start to use your, your, your gaze, your eye tracking to understand, okay, you're looking at that content more. Maybe that's more interesting. It creates more on that one and that one. So um, it will happen for sure. I don't think it even takes that long. It's probably five or ten years out that you put the headset on and you start to describe the things that you want. It creates that one. And it starts to then kind of like think on behalf of you. Uh, what kind of things are you paying attention to? What are the things you're looking at in real life, in, in, in any kind of content? And, you know, it's just like infinite worlds, basically, kind of like coming, coming around you. I think it's, it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, it's quite um, immersive and, 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 um, and it will definitely open a lot of doors for creators of entertainment and, and media and all those kind of things. So um, I think that's the, that's the ultimate, ultimate things. And, and many other technologies and smaller bits will aid to that one and come to that one. But uh, 2D to 3D to immersive uh, based on your prompts, that will happen. Yeah. And to continue in that kind of a world, you talked about this kind of agency and patience, uh, the sort of reciprocity between actors and actees. Mm. But how, for example, in this kind of a world where you have artificial intelligence, for example, working in tandem with, with a person experiencing the experience, what will be the role of the designer? Because one can already see certain kind of dangers in, in this kind of, uh, uh, especially as virtual reality is extremely immersive, it's extremely effective environment, and it's totally different thing that, for example, one would go to an art gallery and experience uh, profound experiences, like this kind of uh, mm. strong stimulata there, you know, this kind of uh, this world, but you see them from afar. It's very different when you are in that. So what kind of, as a designer, what kind of uh, possibilities, but also challenges do you see with these kind of uh, emerging tools? Yeah, I think it's kind of the one of a, a guide or a shepherd. Um, according to a couple of the theorists I had on screen and also some others, the role of the designer will be in creating and um, sort of setting the limits of the role of a drama manager, so-called and uh, the drama managers will be part of the AI system and they will determine, shape uh, what you do and don't see and experience, mainly um, in terms of ensuring there's a satisfying narrative structure. And that sounds to me almost equally appealing as you know, creating a story and how it's expressed visually, auditorily, beat for beat. Um, the one, the one apprehension I do have about the designer's role as being the one that creates the drama manager, who then manages the narrative, 
is that you kind of have to subscribe to um, an aesthetic framework to, to, to operate within. Uh, how does a drama manager know that it is at the climax of a story or it should be kind of segueing into denouement? Um, you've got to pick something like, I don't know, an Aristotelian uh, poetics. And in that regard, I think the danger is that we um, wind up endlessly recycling the past. You know, don't get me wrong, classical narratives can be fantastic, but do we really want the future of um, XR storytelling to be determined by the things that most that feel most most comfortable, most familiar to a kind of Western, white Western audience? Um, I think there's many more possibilities and we could probably um, do well by ignoring the shape of stories from the past and, you know, let people just go buck wild. Yeah, I think that that is one of the crucial points because, like, for example, even as the students utilizing virtual reality, they come from a different fields. They come from architecture or game design. But they still have this kind of a baggage or traditions how things should be portrayed in virtual reality, for example. So how to have this kind of... Um, let the virtual reality as a medium to transform the original mediums to something new, be it uh, music. You are embedded in the music. You play with your body. You, Photography, how does it translate or transform? Film, the old conventions need to change. But to what and how? That's a <laughs> one thing. Um, yeah, if I could say for certain, then uh, I think I'd have a better job. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how will virtual reality change the way that we experience music? I mean, I think you could, <laughs> again, I sound like a broken record, just endlessly pointing to existing media and how things remediate other things. Um, the music video simultaneously did and didn't completely shake up the way that we experience music, right? Because I could still listen on my hi-fi and ignore MTV, or, um, or it opens up an entire new world of possibilities, opportunities for filmmakers, marketers, um, record producers and promoters. If the question is how is it going to change things uh, perceptually and experientially, then I'd have to put my hands up and say I've got absolutely no idea. But um, I, I generally advocate for not thinking in, in terms of um, past media, despite the fact that I, I said we can learn from film history. Mm. Um, because we shouldn't just put films in VR. We can look at the way that it, it kind of uh, played with society and shaped culture and things like that. But uh, no one could have seen... Um, I mean, if you look at the very beginning of cinema, n the camera was static. Nobody even anticipated cuts and editing much right at the very beginning. Mm. So it's impossible to know till you see it kind of begin to sprout. Yeah. So uh, like a direct translation is not preferable compared to a total mutation of the medium that you are pr transporting into virtual reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in, in my opinion, it, it, um, it's inevitable that people will cut and paste um, from what they know, and it's perhaps a necessary part of the creative process, but I think we know that we're reaching something bordering on medium maturity when, when it starts to look unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also needs for the adoption, I think it, you need some kind of like reminder of the past to help you to transition to the next, next phase that, you know, it, it was not a, if you think about the, like the, the first UIs for a mobile phone, they were like, you know, this skeuomorphism that you took the ideas of a real world and you transferred it to the into into a mobile phone, and you know that happens in the in the um, in the mixed reality as well. That you take the ideas of a computer, two D computing operating system, and you put them in a spatial interface. So you have to always carry something from the past to make people to adapt it. It's really important to you know think about this adoption. Like how do they? How you get them to? lured in or smoothened into the new technology, especially for marketers, it's mm. super important. And, you know, anybody who wants to commercialize that technology. But you need to create these kind of mental things that it eases you up. And then you start to, like, you know, give them agency to actually start to, you know, blow that stuff up. So, mm. you know, you create the familiar path agency and then there, you know, you know, chaos comes and then, you know, new things will creative destruction will come and they will throw those away and create new things on top of that. But it's, um, it's rarely it goes away that, you know, that there's a clean mm. cut between these. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Mm. I mean, yeah, Windows icons, menus and pointers would have been incomprehensible if there hadn't been command yeah. line before that. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Slowly, slowly. Yeah. What about this kind of uh, 
more of a creative destruction. When we talk about virtual worlds, we talk easily about also moderation, intellectual property, and these are the issues that, for example, this question is for you both. But do we also need to rethink the content? Because what we bring into the virtual worlds, they are certain kind of uh, captures or representations of this world. How we behave, how we sound, how we look, that's our you know, bodily IP, it's my property. But it's not so simple when it can be captured. Your gait, your eye gaze, your voice can be like suddenly disseminated all over the world. You have server on the North American continent, you have one client in Asia and one in uh, Europe, for example. Where is the legislation? Where is... Yeah. So like, how... So it's super, think about. So, super interesting and you know that not so long ago there was a case of like you know Hollywood, Hollywood actors and their voice and you know how AI can use their voice and likes mm -hmm. about like that they're scanned and put in the mm -hmm. movies uh, you know that's interesting but I, I think it's far more interesting to think about in the context of like everyday people when my son was born I did a photogrammetry scan of him he was a baby and he was sleeping and you know and uh, it's pretty cool like you could see it and it almost looks like a statue but the but the thing is like you can already do that uh, quite easily with you know any one of us could be like you know scanned and rigged and and you know soon they will you know talk and you give a voice and basically it gives like you know easy portal to this kind of like you know I immortality basically that you know you have a person who can talk and walk and, and, and behave like a person who, who has deceased or, or who has never you know, lived or lived for a short, short time. So, um, so those are very interesting kind of like questions on who has that <laughs> IP. <laughs> but you know, that kind of like taking that idea of Hollywood, but you know, putting it into the common people, to everyone. That, you know, those are driving those things, but the far more interesting question is when it happens to all of us. All of our, all of our kind of like uh, parents or our kids or ourselves, and how do we want to kind of like keep ourselves, or do we want to keep ourselves living forever in some kind of virtual, uh, virtual reality, and who has the ownership of that one, and, 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 uh, and who, you know, is the guardian of, of, of that one. Super interesting. I mean, there, there's a ton of potential for business in, in, in that one uh, for sure, but it's, it's, it opens up a lot of like these kind of philosophical questions about life and, <laughs> and, and uh, ownership and, and parenthood and, and, and all that kind of things. Super interesting. It will, will become very mainstream questions in like next 10 years for sure. Yeah. yeah. I would, um, I'd be hesitant to frame it in terms of intellectual property, but I see this problem that you're describing already very much in our, our kind of internet browsing. Um, the trail of clicks that you leave isn't <laughs> deliberately constructed as a trail of clicks, but that's how marketers use it. I think if, if you, know, you know, certain shadier corporations, um, the big five, we all know consciously and rationally, if asked, if prompted, uh, is your web, uh, your web usage being transformed into a data object that is kind of weird, uncanny <coughs> facsimile of you um, that's then you know, optimized to sell you better stuff. Most people would respond now, yeah, I, I know that. I know that's a risk and it's the price that I'm willing to pay in order to use the biggest social networks or whatever. Mm. Um, but regulation is almost necessarily se several steps behind. Yeah. Uh, the worst stuff has to happen. The Cambridge Analytica scandal has to take place before we can say, oh, this is, this is what can go wrong. Okay, maybe we should uh, jump in. And in the case of eye movements, um, your gait data, your movement data, um, in my mind, it's, it's, it's undeniable that the person who produces it owns it and the onus is on the company to be upfront about what they're capturing and what they're using it for. But I don't think we're going to see a fair and just and equitable um, you know, template for that anytime soon. Yeah. So like with every, every technology, it seems like virtual reality and or extended realities can't stay in their own cocoon, in their own technology uh, artist world, but it's, it flows into the real world and we have the legislation, uh, ethical issues that will yeah. come with that mm. kind of discussion. And I think it was a good point you said, totally about like this kind of like Cambridge Analytica needs to happen, like, you know, before things happen. I totally agree. I think it's, it's up and coming in the, in the uh, 
in this like eye tracking, for example, like I said, I was talking with this EU EU panel, um, and uh, I, you know, I was talking about the eye tracking. They were like, uh, but then I, I, I guess one word that kind of woke them up a little bit. I said, like, you know, think about this as that, you know, with your eyes, you can come basically like, you know, that's the kind of like the shared collective conscious of like Europeans, and they're like, oh, okay, well, that is, no, okay, maybe we. So, so it 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 kind of like you need to, you know, in order to hopefully maybe not to avoid that kind of scandal happening you need to also be very clever in a way that you you know talk about these technologies in a way that people realize like you need you need to find some kind of analogies and and some kind of like ways to people that they can kind of like understand the the bigger issues like behind like eye tracking for example and many other technologies and and in many times it's just like it's also a failed attempt to communicate those future dangers uh, in, a, in a right way until it really kind of like happens and people are like, oh my God, my data has been used in a so wrong ways uh, for, for a long time. So it's also a call for being able to have a, you know, some kind of like communication marketing skills to, you know, market the worst possible outcomes. Uh, tell these narratives like, this, like you said, the drama, uh, drama narrator or drama curator. Um, I think it's applies to also be a little bit like um, upfront and, and try to tell people at what might be the possible misuses for those kind of technologies. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we could also like have a time for questions from the audience and there seems to be... Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for the amazing talks and the fantastic panel discussion. Uh, I'm going to throw you into the deep end. I have a question about the regulations, responsibility and philosophy. So what is going to happen to humans uh, when we let people go wild and we kind of move into this matrix reality and future where we create everything, everything is possible and then we bring the people into the real world. What's going to happen to human psyche? How are we going to interact? Who is responsible to like uh, predict or follow all of this? Or, or as a software creator, so are you just going to throw everything out and then see what what's going to happen? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the Rock question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. My question back to you would be, is it a thought experiment or a foregone conclusion? Um, because I would hope that we don't end up with a matrix scenario. We can, you know, we're probably safest to assume that the worst will, will happen. And, um, yeah, think about all other scenarios as, as lesser versions of that. Um, maybe we're already seeing glimmers of what you're talking about with, with Gen Z um, or whatever comes after that, even younger people who um, maybe came of age during the pandemic, during lockdowns, and at risk of sounding patronizing, struggle to distinguish reality from, from mediated fiction in some respects already. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is. It sounds kind of tractable, but um, I would imagine that in terms of changing our psyche, like you said, people will be more not just more um, disposed to, but more happy to embrace fictions, mm -hmm. live, live in the kind of dream world, right? You know, the bad guy or one of the uh, antagonists in Matrix, Cypher, yeah. says ignorance is bliss. He wants to go back in. It's safer. It's a womb. Um, but as for what are the responsibilities of governments and educators and, and anyone else, um, I think it's to ask probing profound questions like yours. What do we do in case of a worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, have a, I have a one question, uh, well, one kind of answer to that one. I was just telling the story that, you know, when I ask people about something at work or something, and then I like just through email or Slack, and then I get an answer and I get this feeling that this answer is actually created by ChatGPT. Like this is not, you have not written this, you have just copied it from somewhere. And, and you start to become critical of that, you know, text, textual information that comes in front of you. And, and you somehow know that, you know, this kind of like makes sense, but it doesn't really make sense. It's like, it's, it's kind of, 
you kind of have this kind of like finger feeling that there's something a little bit off in that one. And I kind of feel that this kind of critical thinking, for example, that is like driven by academia is super important. The more computers start to hallucinate, whether they are in text or 2D or 3D or, you know, finally in the matrix. So you need to have this kind of like sensibility to say like, you know, stop, does it really make sense? Like, is this answer now really, you know, a good answer or is it just kind of hallucinated piece of like what kind of like makes sense but it doesn't really so this kind of critical thinking already now towards like everything that you're seeing that kind of like just is created in an instant through like currently in chat gpt and many other tools created in an instant but it's 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 kind of like it but it's not really it so i i think the education uh to be critical of any kind of inf information that you're encountered, whether it's like highly immersive 3D, 2D, or kind of e even immersive, is super important. That age is starting already now, so hopefully our kids and their kids at some point when they see a virtual world around them, it's like, does it really make sense? You know, should I go into the forest and put a camp there, you know, uh, spend some time there, uh, you know, in, in the real nature, like, you know, that kind of like s questions to be critical about the, their environment. Does it make sense? I, I feel that there's, I hope that, at least I try to with my kids to be <laughs> pushing them in that direction. Just a, a short one. Is there like age limitations for children that you would see that must be applied like in for watching films, example, or any kind of games. So certain ages, because when you talk about like um, that people, like uh, at least adults understand mm. uh, what is real and what is not. But yeah. would you see it super important then for the children to be limited of the access up to certain age, yeah, et cetera? It is a great question. With my kids, I've been putting their warrior headsets on. I like, there's a car, but it's not really there. Or, you know, you can see magic like in the frozen, but it's coming from your hands. Um, so I, I think it's this kind of like, you know, I don't think it's good or bad, but you, of course, you know, I wouldn't put a horror movie, like, you know, they would go crazy. But, uh, but the point is that you need to have, you know, you need to get them, uh, you know, to understand the technology limitations, what it is. Uh, and, you know, just like with the films and with the, any other entertainment, yes, there will be governing bodies of, of like games and all that. But again, you know, you need to be super, you know, uh, understanding that as a parent, like what makes sense. So more you uh, understand the technology, the better better you can guide it. And then there's one more question. Uh, hi, a bit more maybe practical question. Uh, uh, we know there's already a lot of uh, like 3D material out there, and okay, and um, uh, when you build a factory or something, you already basically have the digital twin available these days. But there's also a lot of uh, material, us and our older non-digitized environments that to the degree will be required to be digitized. And what do you think is the like, best practical way forward? Is it like LiDAR or photogrammetry or AI-generated 3D material or some um, combination of these or something else entirely? Yeah, okay, so you asked about like transferring like things to a virtual reality. Yeah, that's a really great, great question. We are, we are experimenting with, with pretty much all of those. You know, all of them has um, uh, pros and cons. Photogrammetry is great for capturing a reality like it is, but it's a still image, it's very static. It's like, you know, frozen in time. So again, like the holy grail is that, you know, this, but in 3D, transferred real time to the cloud, being a real-time updating model where it would need to have a camera all around, you know, super expensive. It would take a lot of bandwidth, a lot of... It would be <laughs> very expensive to do that. But that's ultimately what, what it should be. Um, but currently, you know, as, as we are now, I, I do think the, um, this kind of like uh, photogrammetry is already you know, super cool, it, but it's just frozen in time. Then you have this kind of like... Um, uh, neural networks now with NVIDIA, we are working closely with NVIDIA on, you know, making them a little bit more lively, a little bit like more instantly created. And there are a bunch of other like um, up and coming algorithms and technologies for that one uh, that is happening. But again, I, I, I kind of like start to think from the like, what is the user experience that we are trying to get, which is a real time updating 3D model, and then try to like, what is the shortest time to, 
to get there through, through technology. And, um, and, um, and, and that's what we are experimenting. I don't have the definite answer, but, uh, but I, give, I would say that currently the photogrammetry is like, gives the best peak to the future of those technologies that I've seen today. I would have to be a stick in the mud about this one and say it doesn't matter. We first want to ask what's it for. Um, do we need digital archive versions or doubles of absolutely everything? And um, who, who's going to experience them if the server farms <laughs> that take care of the, the massive amounts of data that you mentioned uh, kick out so much heat, have such a huge carbon footprint that we ruin everything even faster than we already are? Then I, I don't know if it makes sense to have a museum of the world that once was. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Sorry, that's yeah, yeah. No, deeply I, unsatisfying in, in, in response to what you actually asked, but um, I'd be conscious of the material um, you know, outcome of doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. Some, somebody needs to ask that question. It's super yeah. important to be critical. Like, you know, is, it, is it really the thing yeah. that we want? Yeah. Um, we can, but do we need to? Yeah, is somebody it's willing like to pay for it? Is somebody like, you know, yeah. willing to actually, is yeah. there a business sense into that one? You know, if you think about like, commercial structure uh, around that one that drives these things. Okay, then there's one more question. Uh, hello, thanks for the, for the nice discussion. For, um, and my question is basically we are like 10 years in from the second wave maybe of VR and we are at the point that it's more or less stable, at least it's not so much of a hype and most of us have one way or another experienced VR or XR. Uh, so um, I want to, spe to, to ask both of you because we, we discussed a lot about what like the new fruits of technology will bring and what will enable. Uh, so I have the same question for both of you in different ways. So for you, see, like the, the novelty, I believe, of your company is that it doesn't really, uh, among VR-related uh, uh, hardware companies, is that it doesn't rela relate so much with the video game phenomenon or media. Uh, so, and, 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 and you're very much on the, on the kind of high, the Rolls Royce, let's say, of headsets. So I was going to ask you, like, because we talked about uh, a lot of speculations of, of technology and, like, how much of that... Like a, a large part of that probably uh, <coughs> relies on uh, engineering new technologies, new engineering solutions, like new screen sensors, whatever, right? Uh, new GPUs, um, new paradigms of, of technology. And, but another thing would be also, like as you discussed, workflows, like how these are adopted, how like maybe creative uh, applications and artistic explorations might kind of explore what is possible already to do with what, what is given already. And, and to Dulie, I want to, because I know he's also working on, on VR projects, uh, like also given the current technology that we, we have, what do you think, like what, what are, the, are the frameworks that we have already kind of there to support experimentation in VR, whether they're artistic or creative or, or whatnot? Or, so what do you think, like if we put, if, if we put technological advancements on the side, uh, how can we advance with what we have? How we can explore the space of technology that we have today? Great, thanks. Uh, great question. So yeah. To start with, yeah, exactly. We are, we are not in the entertainment space in a way. But but then again, like what inspired Vario in the very beginning was definitely this kind of like the virtual worlds of the entertainment, like you know, games and all that. That kind of like was the original idea. But then the reality is hit that Vario, as a company in Finland doing R and D in Finland, the only way we can survive is that we 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 serve the highest end of the highest end and make a product where we don't need to think about the cost of putting the cost down, but we you know, serve those who are ready to pay for the most advanced uh, technology out there. Um, the, um, uh, you referred in your question about the, uh, the new sensors and technologies and all that, how dependent we are on those. Um, we are very uh, much on the lookout all the time on the new, like, you know, what's the latest in LiDAR sensors? What's the latest in camera sensors? How can we bring maximum amount of photons, photos, photons in and out with a minimum lag and all that? So, yes, it is, it is very much like that to understand, like, uh, what is our customers' needs and, you know, what kind of technology is out there and how do we combine those? So it is, it is a constant search for the new technology, but at the same time, I understand what our customers are, are wanting. And the good thing about our customers is that they're so needy. They're so needy that, you know, we can never, we can never do those things in a, in a, in a exactly when they, want, when they want that to have. But we can say, like, yeah, this can be possible in two years or five years or something like that. Um, so, yeah, and 
I forgot about the second part of your question. You talked about the sen you asked about the sensors and what was the other question? Sorry? So creative. How, yeah, so how much of innovate like how much innovation could we yes. produce creative, creative experimentation, yeah. for example? Good, excellent, thanks. So um, one great quote that I heard from um, an Italian car designer was that uh, when he started to use various technologies that we were asking, like, you know, how much time do you save or something like that. And he said, like, well, I don't really save time, but what it enables me to be is much more creative in my creations. And I asked, like, so what do you mean? And he said that the thing is that when they, in the back in the day, when they did uh, physical car models, right, that they made it out of clay or from wood, uh, the thing is that they worked on that kind of thing for, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 10 weeks or five weeks, and it cost, you know, hundreds of thousands. And then their manager came, manager came and looked at it, they had a half an hour session, and, and the manager was like, oh, you know, I don't like it, like, back to the drawing board. So you lost a lot of time and money in order to, you know, pass that, manager review and uh, and it affected their design so that they became you know thinking already like you know will he or she like this or you know is this too progressive or, or is this you know something so what happened uh, now when they slowly this has just happened in the in the last year in two years is that they can actually now start to do these cars or concept these cars without physical models it's very you know most of them still use clay or something but some of them already are in this world so they can experiment much more quickly and more agile without you know spending hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands on clay or or, or wood models and then the iterations are much more rapid. So when the manager comes and they like, okay, I don't like it, then they can like immediately start to work on that one and, and iterate in a much more faster cycle. So what it means that they, that's what he, he said, that they can, it actually allows for much more creative approach to the work as well. And, uh, and it's really great to see now, you know, the latest cars that are coming out, you can actually see that the shapes of the cars are now become formed by the fact that they don't need to prototype it <laughs> anymore in a, using a physical material. So it's great. It affects the creativity as well. Mm. We also are uh, working a lot with, with artists. Um, for example, Finnish artist called Jani Leinonen um, has been visiting our, our studio for a, for a long time and we did a piece with Jani Leinonen, his critique on materialism and, and, and the future of virtual worlds. And, and many times these artists do ask questions that we don't ask and, and, and they, you know, pose a, you know, great challenge in what should be the future of this technology. And, and, you know, I like to work with them and we like to work with them. They do things that, you know, engineers or, or designers or, or aerospace companies wouldn't do. It's great. It gives us a new perspective as well. So, um, so I, I do think it's very valuable, uh, this creative approach uh, as well. And it's, it's helpful. Yeah, thank you, Jose. I yeah. think we can answer your question like a take. And we have one more question there. So... Could you briefly uh, yeah, if the take on that and if the gist of it was if the to, uh, if the technology stays stable, how do our approaches to creating for it evolve? Um, I think it's kind of a case of putting it in the hands of weirdos and seeing what sticks. Right, it's a classical supply and demand thing. Once someone goes, oh, that was strange. I like that. I'd like to see more of that. Then. Uh, people will start um, following a particular style or genre or whatever. And I'm thinking how, you know, Vine or now TikTok um, is just video, but it's video done in a particular way with a particular flavor and people jump on the trend. Okay, thank you. One more question and then we're probably out of time. So, Well, I have one um, question, which is maybe a little bit of continuation from the previous is that I'm... Um, I myself come from performance and, and uh, choreography and work with uh, XR spaces and performative spaces and, and I'm curious how you, like what is your take because I have, I, I think that or I have a slight problem with the VR spaces in that sense that are, they are the technologies and the developments are highly concentrated on visual sense. And you know the de de development of the text and te tech and you know even the I understand the eye tracking is kind of um, originally developed for better resolution quality. Mm. But do you see other ways of thinking of the virtual spaces and experiences and create kind of like creating creative spaces of thinking of the 
what the technology enables as far as tracking the body, tracking even the eye, you know, the eye movement also that can be used for more embodied experiences that are not concentrating so much on the visual information that we are receiving. Thank you. Excellent question. So, understand. Yeah, I mean, haptic devices are incredibly exciting, and I agree with you. Underdeveloped um, in comparison to the sensors that we tend to privilege. Um, I think for site-specific performances, they're extremely powerful and must be leveraged, but obviously they're expensive and hard to come by, and maybe you don't even get the kind of haptic resolution that you would like. Um, I also don't think that strapping more and more and more to the body uh, is, is kind of the way to go for more um, consumer-oriented uh, mainstream VR or XR. But um, I'm sorry, I think I'm going off track from, from the thrust of your question. <laughs> but um, yeah, the auditory element. Yeah. Um, it's tough because, as you say, even if you achieve an incredible uh, quality or resolution going in, unless every person that you immerse in the experience has a thousand euro set of headphones, then you might not, you might not deliver the experience that you have managed to capture or synthesize. Um, sorry if that's not a very satisfying answer. I, yeah, yeah I, I think that it's, it's a really good question. The visual part of, of the virtual reality has been like, you know, if you think about the evolution of that, when first you see some blocks and then you start to see more pixels and, and then finally the dream was to, you know, see things in human eye resolution. And once you see it, then you say like, well, you know, you don't really f yet, even no matter how accurately you see, you don't really feel that you're there, just like, just like you said. Uh, one thing that at least for me, it was a lot of big thing that you could see yourself in there, that you could see your body and, you know, you could track your, your feet and your hands and everything that you kind of like feel that you are there. Um, that, ha that has been at least one big part of that one. But yeah, for sure, uh, sound, sound is a big, big part of that one, uh, for sure. Uh, but I, I kind of like also feel that now the visual part is, it's not like 100% cracked, but it's, it's, very realistic already. So mm -hmm. now I'm sure somebody will start to work on the, the other parts of that uh, system. But now at least that part is like quite, quite good. Uh, yeah. if, so I can, one. Yeah. if I can just add really quickly, um, maybe the kind of thing you're getting at is, uh, is possible or, or fruitful to take advantage of cross-modal perception or you know, synesthesia, um, playing to one sense and then expecting, hoping that the person will experience it in another. I'm thinking of things like, uh, I believe it's called the McGurg effect, where you can watch footage of someone's lips making a certain shape. And then depending on whether you're reading the phoneme ba or pa, you hear a different thing. Um, these are the kinds of cognitive uh, quirks that you know, I would like to investigate more and try and take advantage of in a kind of artistic way. Mm. Hey, it's time to wrap up. Thank you for the audience here live and behind the cameras. And especially thank you for fantastic talk, Julian Jussi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.